The Bus Conductor by E.F. Benson. Edited by Doug Bolden. Read by Doug Bolden. It was uh, the 24th of June, just 18 months ago. I had left my flat, you may remember, and came up from the country to stay with you for a week. We had dined alone here in Graham Street, and after dinner I went out to a party and you stayed home. At dinner, your man did not wait on us, and when I asked where he was, you told me he was ill, and I thought you changed the subject rather abruptly. You gave me your key when I went out, and on coming back, I found you had gone to bed. There were, however, some letters waiting for me, and they required answers, so I wrote them there and then and posted them at the filler box opposite. It was uh, rather late when I went upstairs. You had put me in the front room on the third floor overlooking the street, a room which I thought you generally occupied yourself. It was a very hot night, and though there had been a moon when I started to the party, my return, the whole sky was covered in clouds, and it looked and felt as if we might have a thunderstorm before the morning. I was feeling very sleepy and heavy, and it was not until after I had gotten into bed that I Noticed by the shadows of the window frames on the blind that only one of the windows was open. It did not seem worthwhile to get out of bed in order to open it, so I went to sleep feeling rather airless and uncomfortable. What time it was when I awoke, I do not know, but it was certainly not yet dawn. And I never remember being conscious of such a extraordinary stillness that prevailed then. There was no sounds, no foot passengers or wheel traffic. It's like the music of life had become absolutely mute. But now, instead of feeling sleepy and heavy, I felt, though I must have only slept for an hour or two, perfectly fresh and wide awake. And the effort, which had not seemed worth making before, that of getting out of bed and opening the other window, was quite easy now. So I pulled up the blind and I threw it wide open and I leaned out and I just felt parched and pined for air. Even outside, the oppression was noticeable, though, as you know, I am not easily given to the mental effects of climate. I was aware of an awful creepiness coming over me. I tried to analyze it away uh, without success. The past day had been pleasant. I look forward to another pleasant day tomorrow, and yet I was full of some nameless apprehension. I felt, too, dreadfully lonely in the stillness before dawn. Then I heard suddenly, and not from very far away, the sound of an approaching vehicle. I could distinguish the tread of two horses walking in a slow foot's pace. They were, though not yet visible, coming up the street. And yet this indication of life did not abate that dreadful sense of loneliness. And in some dim, unformulated way, that which was coming seemed to me to have something to do with the cause of my oppression. The vehicle came into sight. At first, I could not tell what it was, then I saw that the horses were black and had long tails, and that what they dragged was made of glass and had a black frame. It was a hearse, only empty. It was moving up the side of the street and stopped at your door. Then the obvious solution struck me. You had said at dinner that your man was ill, and you were, I thought, uh, unwilling to speak more about it. No doubt, so I imagined, uh, he was dead. And for some reason, perhaps because you did not want me to know anything about it, you were having the body removed late at night. This, I must tell you, passed my mind quite instantaneously, and it did not really occur to me just how unlikely it was. I was still leaning out the window, and I remember also wondering, and only momentarily, how odd it was that I saw things, or rather the one thing I was looking at so distinctly. The moon was behind the clouds, but it was curious how every detail of the hearse and horse were visible. There was only the one man, the driver with it, and the street was otherwise absolutely empty. It was him I was looking at now. I could see every detail of his clothes where I was at, so high above him. I could not see his face, though. He had on gray trousers, brown boots, a black coat buttoned all the way up, and a straw hat. Over his shoulder there was this little strap which seemed to support some sort of little bag. He 
looked like a, exactly like a bus conductor. And even while I was thinking this, he looked up at me. He had this long, thin face, but on his left cheek there was a mole of, uh, with a growth of dark hair on it. And all of this was distinct, as if it had been noon, and I was just a yard away from him, but I had no time to think it strange that the driver of the hearse should be so unfunerally dressed. Then he touched his hat to me and jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Just room for one inside, sir. This was something so odious, so coarse, so unfilling that I instantly drew my head in. Pulled the blind down again, and then for what reason I do not know, turned on the light in order to see what time it was. The hands on my watch pointed to half past eleven. It was then for the first time, I think, that a doubt crossed my mind as to the nature of what I had seen. But I put out the light again, got into bed, got into bed, and began to think. We had dined, I had gone to a party, I had come back and written letters, and gone back to bed, and Slept. How can it be half past eleven? Or what half past eleven was it? An easy solution stuck me. My watch must have stopped, but holding it up to my ear, I could hear it ticking. There was stillness and silence. I expected every moment to hear the muffled footsteps on the stairs, the footsteps moving slowly and smallly under the weight of a heavy burden. But from inside your house, there was no sound whatsoever. Outside, too, there was the same dead silence, and the hearse waited at the door. As the minutes ticked on and ticked on, at length I began to see a difference in the light in the room, and I knew that dawn was beginning to break. But how had it happened, then, that the, if the corpse was being removed at night, it was not yet gone, and the hearse still waited, and the morning was coming? Presently, I got out of bed, and with this sense of strong physical shrinking, I went to the window and pulled back the blind. The dawn was coming fast. The whole street was lit by that silver, hueless light of morning, but there was no hearse there. I looked again at my watch. It was a quarter past four, but I would swear that not half an hour had passed since it had told me it was half past eleven. There was this curious double sense, as if I was living in the present and at the same moment had been living at some other time. It was dawn, June 25th, and the street was empty. A little while ago, there was the driver of the hearse, and he had spoken to me, and it was half past eleven. What was that driver? To what plane of existence did he belong? And again, what half past eleven had I seen recorded on the dial of my watch? And then I told myself the whole thing had been a dream, but if you ask me whether or not I believe what I told myself, I must confess that I did not. Your man did not appear at breakfast the next morning, nor did I see him again before I left. I think if I had, I would have told you about all this. But it was still possible, you see, that what I had seen was a real hearse, driven by a real driver, for all the ghastly gaiety of his face and the levity of his pointing hand. I might possibly have fallen asleep after seeing him and slumbered through the removal of the body and the departure of the horse. So I did not tell you about it. I still don't know whether it was a dream or not. I can only say what I believe, which is that I was awake. And in any case, the rest of my story is odd. Exactly a month afterwards, I was in London again, but only for the day. I arrived at Victoria at 11 and took the underground to Sloan Square in order to see if you were in town and would give me lunch. It was a terribly hot morning, and I intended to take the bus from King's Road as far as Graham Street. There's one standing at the corner just as I came out of the station, but I saw that the top was already full, and inside looked pretty full, too. Just as I came up, the conductor, who I suppose had been inside, collecting fares or whatnot, came out onto the steps within a few feet of me. He wore gray trousers, brown boots, a black coat, straw hat, and that little strap with that little bag that held his punch machine. And I saw his face, and you know, right there on there was that mole, the hair sticking out of it on his left cheek. And then he spoke to me, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. 
Just room for one inside, sir. At that, a sort of panic terror took possession. I mean, I knew I gesticulated wildly and screamed, No! No! But at that moment, I was living not in the hour that was passing, but in the hour which had passed a month ago, when I leaned out of your window just before the dawn. What I had seen there had some significance, now being fulfilled beyond the significance of the trivial happenings of today and tomorrow. The powers of which we know so little were visibly working before me, and I stood there on the pavement, shaking and trembling. I was opposite the post office at the corner, just as the bus started, my eyes fell on the clock. I don't need to tell you what time it was. Perhaps I don't even need to tell you the rest, because you can probably conjecture it, since you will not have forgotten what had happened at the corner of Sloan Square at the end of July, the summer before last. The bus pulled out from the pavement to the street in order to get around the van that was standing in front of it. And at that moment, there came down the King's Road this big, heavy motor going at a hideously dangerous pace. It crashed full into the bus, burying into it and all the people on board as a gimlet burrows into a boar. And that's my story.